Well, I feel exceedingly qualified to uh, introduce the next speaker. And, uh, and so uh, uh, rather than bore you with all the details, I'll just simply say I've written about three books and about 30 articles in this subject, so I feel qualified uh, to speak to it. So science at the doorstep to God, exciting new developments in the world of science that point not only to God, but also point to life after death, the transcendent soul, and also to Jesus. Christ. So, um, you know, the, the topic is so huge, you, you can't, of course, cover it in 30 minutes. But what you can do is give some updates, some exciting sort of updates in a, in a context that will show just how close science is coming to giving really good probative evidence of God, life after death, and Jesus Christ. Let's start with uh, some interesting sort of statistics, because I think it reveals what's going on in the world of science today vis-a-vis -vis God. Um, today, um, uh, you know, 51% of scientists overall are theists. They're believers in God or a higher transcendent power. 41% um, uh, are agnostics or atheists, probably about split down the middle, about 21% uh, agnostic and 20% uh, atheist. So 51% um, 20% of uh, 51% theists, 20% atheists, hardly what I would call overwhelming atheism in the sciences. But more importantly is the statistic about young scientists, the under 40 uh, scientists. The young scientists are 66% self-declared, this is the Pew survey of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, right? So it's not Spitzerian statistics. So so the, the key thing is, is it's 66% young scientists self-declare as theists, as believers in God or um, a higher a transcendent power or truth. Now, once you get to that um, uh, statistic, you go, wow, that's huge. By comparison to the overall 51%, the scientific world, the younger generation, is more and more believers uh, today than ever before, and it continues continues to grow. If we go all the way back 10 years when Francis Collins was, uh, 20 years, when Francis Collins was doing his first surveys, uh, you can see that we've gone from 45% to 51% and slowly but surely we're creeping our way uh, up to an overall, uh, you know, ranking well above 60% and a super majority in the scientific community. Physicians are even more interesting according to these two um, uh, surveys that were uh, done uh, by the Louis um, uh, Finkelstein Institute and also by the National Institute of Health, you can see 76% of uh, physicians declared themselves to be either religious or believers in God. And um, I think it was something like 12.4% uh, were agnostics and 11 point something percent were uh, atheists. Now you look at that and you just go, man, that is a, that's incredible. You gotta ask yourself, What's, why has this change occurred? Why have we kind of come out of the uh, agnostic, atheistic doldrums of naturalism and just sprung forth? Well, I hope to give you a sense of that today uh, because I think there, there are many reasons for it. Certainly, the, the increase in cosmological evidence is a really big um, part of this. I mean, you can't go to an observatory now. I mean, it's so funny. You, you know, you, you go into an observatory and at the lunchroom, right, uh, you know, people are, are going to, well, what are you? Uh, you know, an agnostic, an atheist, or a theist. You know, I mean, the conversation goes right to God. It's really unbelievable. But the reason I think is, uh, first of all, increased cosmological evidence. Second thing that's uh, very evident is near-death experiences, which I'll talk about later. Uh, this has had a profound influence, not just on the medical communities, but it's sort of like everybody knows somebody who at least knows somebody who, who experienced one. And it really is becoming quite prolific, especially those who 
uh, are now looking for scientific evidence of, of near-death experiences, peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences, and finding them. And then I, I think also, um, of course, there's the uh, um, uh, a variety of other things, but uh, I think um, the appearance of the miraculous is, is quite remarkable. Uh, the Finkelstein Institute went ahead and did a, a study of physicians' beliefs in miracles, and today, physicians, 74% of physicians believe that miracles happen in the past and in the present. Whoa. All I can say is things are a changing. They're not so bad as we might have thought. Naturalism doesn't have the edge that everybody thinks, not at least in the thinking, rational, uh, scientific community. It does not. Let's take a look at some of the updates in uh, cosmology. What's going on in the whole area of physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and creation? Well, I'm going to have to simplify this uh, a whole lot, uh, but I'm going to give you the upshot. Uh, it, th there's a thing that we call fine-tuning coincidences. And, and, and fine-tuning coincidences, that really refers to the numbers in our universal constants, the numbers in our universal uh, initial conditions that define the way the universe is, whether it's going to be hostile to life or friendly to life. Our universe is decidedly friendly to life. But the constants in our universe and the initial conditions of our universe are not defined by any physical laws or theories. That means that those constant values and initial condition values, they kind of happen by pure chance, could have, because of course there's no natural influence to determine what those numbers would be. But let me give you the picture straight through. If you're going to have our universe be friendly to life, if our universe is going to be friendly to, uh, you know, a nice open organic life form developing within the universe, the odds against that happening by pure chance are 10 secondary, in, uh, second, uh, first in exponent raised to the 10 raised again to the 125 to 1. That's two exponents higher than the Penrose number, but that arises into a much, 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 much bigger number. The point is, the odds of having life in our universe by pure chance are the same odds as a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare, Milton, Spencer, and Eliot by random tapping of the keys in a single try. <laughs> virtually impossible. So, of course, physicists have to come up with some explanation for how this could happen, and that's the job of physicists, right? Job is to find a natural explanation for how, what, but wait a minute, there's no natural determination of the numbers of those constants and initial conditions. So people are searching around, and you know, Bouncing universes won't work because bouncing universes require more fine-tuning as you go back in time. Sean Carroll wiped that out. So, you know, the idea of expanding, contracting, expanding, that's not going to help one bit in explaining fine-tuning. And, of course, uh, you know, string universes in the higher dimensional space of string theory, that's not going to work out either because, you know, when those things are nucleating, uh, they actually are going to increase in entropy and fine-tuning is going to be harder and harder and harder to explain. So when all these things are taken into consideration, there's only two options left. I'm just going to get to the the chase. Even a regular old inflationary multiverse won't work. There's only one kind of multiverse that can do the job of 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 125 to 1 against. And that's an infinite multiverse which has no beginning. The so-called eternal inflation infinite fractal multiverse. Now, for a long time, for the last 10 to 12 years now, this has been a popular favorite among those who uh, do not want to believe in an intelligent creator. Because the intelligent creator is the only other option outside of an infinite, eternal, you know, a fractal multiverse.
Well, then things started to happen to the poor old infinite fractal uh, multiverse. The first thing that happened was, I'll, I'll just, I, I'm gonna skip past something for a second. And get, I'll get to Stephen Hawking and, and uh, Thomas Hertog in just a moment. But um, the first thing that happened was Boltzmann brains and brief brains. And you're probably going, Boltzmann brains? What the world is that? Well, a Boltzmann brain is basically a brain that fluctuates into existence in a single moment with a, a memories fully loaded of being in an organic physical universe like ours and perceiving ourselves to be a life form with other organic life forms like us. That's a brain that just fluctuates into existence in a thermal um, vacuum uh, in a single fluctuation. Now, if you think an infinite multiverse is actually the case, then every one of you here is a Boltzmann brain. Every one of you is a brain that is fluctuating into existence, thinking that you're seeing everybody in this room, thinking that you're in an organic universe like our own, but you're not. You're just fluctuating into existence because the odds are 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 122 higher that you are a Boltzmann brain or a brief brain that fluctuates into existence in a quantum vacuum. But the same thing is the case rather than the organic life form you perceive yourselves to be. Now, physicists, they don't like this too much because they don't want to be thought of as a Boltzmann brain. And the reason they don't want to be a Boltzmann brain is because that throws off the entire empirical observational basis of physics. And so there's a natural resistance in every physicist to go, I don't like this infinite multiverse because I really don't flat out believe that I'm a Boltzmann brain. Well, yet. But if that's what I have to do to deny God, well, maybe, maybe I could bring myself to it. But... Uh, but by and large, they don't want to do this. And that was a real first blow against the poor infinite multiverse. But then comes Stephen Hawking and Ter Thomas Hertog. And goes, Stephen Hawking? I thought he was leaning toward the other side. Was. Not now. In his last academic paper in the Journal of High Energy Physics in 2018, he uh, basically... Uh, put a closure to the infinite multiverse with his partner, Belgian uh, physicist Thomas Hertog. And in that paper, what they showed was that this universe, you know, we have a, what's called a separation between quantum uh, physics and, and relativity physics. And there's this decent separation which allows kind of, uh, you know, uh, an indeterminacy zone uh, within that uh, um, uh, universe. And in any case, the, the point at, at hand that's really important is that you can't get a universe like ours with our quantum uh, uh, theory and our relativity theory uh, the way it is, you can't get that from a fractal multiverse. You just simply can't. And the point, of course, is not only that you don't want to get a fractal multiverse, uh, I mean, a, uh, 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 you can't get a universe like ours uh, from it, but um, what Hawking and Hertog go on to predict in the same paper is that you can't have not only an infinite number of bubble universes, you're going to have a very finite number of bubble universes. If a multiverse, said Hawking, does exist, it would have to be a very finite number of bubble universes. And those bubble universes would be very much like our own universe. And furthermore, the multiverse that generates that universe would have to have a beginning. Eternal inflation must not be eternal. Inflation must have a beginning. So, believe me, it, Hawking still has a lot of weight in the world of physics. And when he wrote that paper with Thomas Hertog, of course, Thomas Banks, uh, another really in, in important physicist, has been writing about this for a long time, saying this eternal inflation is not going to work because right now, I can tell you right now, the reliance on the anthropic principle is so great in these kinds of theories that essentially um, it's going to disagree violently with experimental evidence. 
That's a pretty strong opinion. But banks, of course, is coming also under the category of, of Hawking and Hertog. And then when you combine it with the Boltzmann brains and the brief brains and the very small number of bubble universes that a multiverse is now uh, permitted to, to generate, you put it all together and the infinite multiverse, the eternal inflation theory is looking really weak. In fact, it's looking so weak that we're probably back to either a small number of bubble universes in a multiverse or just our own plain universe. Now, why is that really important? Because if the infinite multiverse is dead, there's really only one option that's left over. And the option is God did it. And in f literally, and a really super smart, intelligent God did it. We're right back to when, right, uh, when um, um, uh, um, uh, we had uh, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, who was the atheistic gadfly in the physics community for a long, long time. And Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, finally, when he discovered the, uh, uh, the odds against having an abundance of carbon uh, in a universe like ours, and what was required, and the, the equations, and the numbers, that went on and on and on against that occurring by pure chance, Hoyle actually said and declared in, in the uh, California Institute of Technology bulletin, he said, look, it seems to me that there are no blind forces worth speaking about. It seems to me that there must be some super calculating, super intellect that has monkeyed with the constants of physics and the constants of chemistry and biology as well. I consider this to be beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now, I'll just leave you with that. That's the current state. Are young physicists looking at this? I think they are. I think they're going, ooh, it's getting very, very hard to resist the idea that there's not only a God uh, out there, a conscious God, but a thinking God. And not only a thinking, rational, super calculating, super intellect God, but a God who really likes us, who made a universe that's habitable for life instead of being hostile for, uh, for life, which of course is what the odds dictate. That's some of the exciting new stuff in the world of cosmology. Let's zoom over now to the world of um, uh, peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences. Uh, in a previous talk uh, uh, over here at the Napa Institute, I guess it was around 2018 or something, I talked about these peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences. I'll just summarize them uh, for you very, very quickly, uh, some of the data that they had discovered. Uh, certainly um, uh, what they discovered, uh, and this is Samuel Parnia's very good study for University of Southampton, peer-reviewed in uh, resuscitation, Journal of Resuscitation, and uh, Dr. Pim von Lommel's study uh, in The Lancet, right? That's the number one uh, medical journal in Britain. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, again, a very, very fine study with uh, he and his team and several other studies by Bruce Grayson, the University of Virginia Medical School, Department of Perceptual Studies, and a variety of other uh, groups have established uh, the following uh, uh, things. First of all, uh, when you die, there is a high likelihood that your soul, or what we might call some sort of spiritual form of yourself, or even a kind of a spiritual extension, felt extension form of yourself, is gonna leave your body. And when it leaves your body, you'll be looking down at your body, you'll be seeing everything. I'm sure you've heard about near-death experiences before. So this kind of a spiritual being has vision, it has consciousness, it has self-consciousness. All of the memories, uh, um, all of your memories will be intact. Uh, you'll have, uh, uh, you know, kind of a super awareness of, of things that are going on around you. Uh, in addition to that, you will have emotion, you'll have the capacity to move, and f you won't even be restrained by the forces of physics. Yeah, you can just go right through the ceiling right here, right now, and just zoom right on up and pass right through the, 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 the roof, which happens all the time. Time. So, of course, uh, that, that's an interesting thing. You say, well, why are there so many peer-reviewed medical journals that come out and say these things? Well, two reasons in particular. First reason is that uh, you've got a lot of veridical data that, that points to this. <clears throat> veridical data is unusual kinds of facts that happen 
uh, which are reported by the patients during the time when they're dead. They're so unusual, they could not have been predicted. You know, if somebody said, well, they put some paddles on my chest and tried to start my heart again, nobody would be surprised. But if they are talking about all kinds of events that are taking place in the waiting room next door, outside of the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, you can start going, let me check on that. And then when you get an independent researcher to check on that and you find out that all of those things occurred and that person was dead in that operating room, that really gets you to thinking. And that's what got uh, Pim Van Lommel and his team thinking and uh, Parnia, et cetera, et cetera, to come out and say there is a likelihood of the survival of consciousness after bodily death uh, along with emotion and self-consciousness and memory, et cetera. The second thing that is going on, and this was the, uh, the Kenneth Ring studies, um, where he determined that 81% of blind people see. And most of these people were blind from birth, so they're seeing for the very first time when they're clinically dead. Flat EEG, fixed and dilated pupils, right? That no gag reflex. I mean, you, you got a few sputterings of neurons in the lower brain and absolutely no electrical activity in the frontal or cerebral cortex. Uh-uh. You're not gonna be doing any thinking with your physical brain, no you're not. And if that is the case, <laughs> just what exactly is doing the seeing? Now for a long, long time, right, um, uh, um, blind people, you know, uh, you know, people thought, well, <clears throat> there's got to be a physicalist explanation for this. And so they tried many, many different explanations, right? So, you know, uh, uh, parietal lobe stimulation, temporal lobe stimulation, uh, anoxia, lack of oxygen. Oh, it's hallucinations from all the morphine that's given to the patient, you know, a pharmaceutical explanation, blah, 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 blah. Okay, there's only three problems with all of those physical ex, uh, physical, physicalist explanations when you're talking about blind people. Blind people don't have any visual images in their brain that they can physically hallucinate in their physical brain since they've never seen anything for their entire lives. How in the world can they give accurate, veridical data of an entire scene that is going on? I'll tell you what blows up, uh, you know, the, the explanations of the physicalists on this uh, score, which of course are cited by Van Lommel and, and Grayson and all the rest of the big um, uh, researchers in this area. But the main thing is, of course, here's this kid, Bradley Burroughs. He's 16 years old, blind from birth. He says, you know, during my near-death experience, I, you know, zoomed right uh, outside of the hospital walls <clears throat> and there I was standing outside and in the snow but I didn't feel anything but I could see the tracks this kid's blind from birth right I could see the tracks of the train in the snow and just about a minute later this train comes by and it's got a big huge sign on the back with an arrow pointing to the right and the train just went down those tracks and and went off to the into the grove of trees he's describing this perfectly and of course you can coordinate the train schedule with the time of Bradley's uh, uh, um, clinical death. And, uh, ooh, he's 100% accurate. That's exactly what happened. How'd the blind kid do it? Bradley Burroughs' response is, I just did it. <laughs> but he didn't hallucinate it. Hallucinations, by the way, are notoriously inaccurate. But he was 100% accurate. Now that's kind of the scene, uh, as you can imagine, and sometimes, of course, uh, you, know, uh, you go to a heavenly domain, the heavenly domain, not all the time, but sometimes you go to a heavenly domain. Uh, there are, of course, uh, in 15% of the cases, there are unpleasant uh, near-death experiences. If you go to the heavenly domain, oftentimes you meet deceased relatives and friends. Those deceased relatives and friends come back with uh, stories of, you know, and, and uh, I mean, the people come back with stories from these deceased relatives and friends they couldn't have possibly known about but they're verified by older relatives later on. Uh, certainly, you know, the white light is particular to about 24% of the, um, the, that they identify with either God or Christ is about 24% of those near-death experiences. What's my point? Well, just uh, to, uh, this year, 2022, 
The New York Academy of Sciences, I mean, for a long time, I've been near-death experiences. Okay, Von Lommel's okay, Parting is okay, they're good doctors, they did some good research, but I mean, near-death experience, you know, they're kind of anecdotal, and you know, you better be careful, and you should be careful. Any kind of anecdotal story, don't buy it. Buy this instead by the statistical evidence in a big, huge study with over 2,000 people over 10 years. That's much better. Now, the key thing, of course, there's multiple studies like that. Now, the point is uh, the peer-reviewed literature on near-death experiences became so extensive that this year the New York Academy of Sciences finally made the declaration that the peer-reviewed literature, uh, medical literature, does warrant a consensus statement from a, a you know, large group of uh, physicians and scientists that basically hold that, um, yeah, it's likely that consciousness is going to survive physical bodily death. That's an interesting thing. Number two, there's going to be a separation of this soul spirit-like form from your physical body. Uh, number three, you're going to have a, you know, a sense of traveling uh, somewhere <clears throat> out of your physical body toward maybe the operating room or outside the hospital or something of that nature, uh, um, you know, um, just around the local area, or you could tra travel uh, to another destination altogether, like a heavenly domain, an otherworldly domain. Uh, the third um, item that they indicate is there's going to be a life review, a life review that is uh, a rather thorough and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, has a sense of where you failed and, did, and, and where you did well. And finally, of course, um, uh, at the end of it, uh, there is <clears throat> a sense of returning back into your body. Now, I'm just quoting the statement from the New York Academy of Sciences, and the main thing that I'm, I'm quoting here is, it's finally out there. People are accepting it as somehow not validated conclusively, but at least something that's validatable conclusively as studies move forward in the future. And that's really quite interesting. Maybe Jesus was right after all about the resurrection. And maybe we're beginning to see in this skeptical, science-oriented, peer-reviewed medical study generation that finally <clears throat> there is something acceptable about belief, not only in a transcendent soul, but life after physical death. Let's go to the Shroud of Turin now. This is the Jesus Studies area. <clears throat> I just want to give you three updates. There are many, many good things about the Shroud of Turin. I could give you another lecture on that. I did one, I think, in 2016 or something or whenever I did it. But anyway, uh, the Shroud of Turin is very fascinating. Of course, I do believe it is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, and I believe in it for um, um, uh, scientific reasons. I mean, I, I, the church has not declared it to be an authentic relic, so I'm not believing it, of course, as a matter of faith, and I don't think anybody should believe it as a matter of, of faith. And I just have uh, enough scientific evidence that I have a certitude that this is uh, the burial cloth of Jesus. But here's just three new little events. All of you, of course, remember the 1988 carbon dating uh, that occurred uh, on the Shroud of Turin a while back. And of course, it said that the Shroud was uh, produced in 12, between 1262 and 1350 or something like that. Everybody thought, oh, medieval forgery, forget all, all about this thing. Initially, that was challenged by Dr. Ray Rogers, who came and said, yeah, I don't think that's right. The strands actually that were used uh, for the test on the Shroud of Turin, those strands for the sample, for the carbon dating samples, had cotton fibers in them. Well, the shroud's a linen fabric. There are no cotton fibers in them. And these cotton fibers had a gum dye mordant that wasn't even available in the world until after 12th century uh, Europe introduced that particular color and that particular kind of um, mordant. And so, of course, uh, you look at this and you go, aha, uh -huh, maybe Rogers is right. By the way, Rogers is no slouch, right? He was head of uh, thermochemistry for Los Alamos laboratories. And, and 
and uh, the editor of Thermochemica, the peer-reviewed uh, medical journal of thermochemistry. So he's a pretty smart guy, but everybody said, eh, you've got to hold off on this. You know, uh, uh, this 1988 carbon day has got to be pretty good still, you know, but uh, Ray Rogers uh, did put a real chink in it. And um, then uh, we just found out um, uh, a few, a couple of months ago that, um, uh, you know, uh, Tristan Casabianca and his team actually came out and uh, published in the peer-reviewed peer uh, journal um, uh, um, uh, Archaeometry, uh, he showed that, um, that this test could not have been valid at all for dating uh, the, 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 uh, the shroud uh, in the 13th century. And uh, the reason, very simply, by the way, Tristan Casabianca for 30 years tried to pry the raw data from the carbon dating out of the British Museum who had obtained custody over it, tried to pry it out of their grip. Finally, on a freedom of information request, he finally got it in 2018. He did the statistical analysis of the raw data. There's so much stratification and variegation, not only among the samples, but within the samples themselves. Casabianca said, there's no way this can possibly accurately date the Shroud to the Middle Ages. And furthermore, there's got to be some explanation for the, the, the stratification, the variegation in the, in, the, in the samples. There's got to be another cloth like those cotton fibers that Ray Rogers found. There's got to be some other cloth fibers woven into these fibers. So, oh, okay. So um, let me just uh, cut to the uh, chase. So um, uh, we then after that, it, it kind of opened everything up. Giulio Fonti, just a real genius in the whole area of, of dating, uh, did three different non-carbon uh, datings um, of the shroud. Uh, the first thing that uh, he did was a, a Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, a Raman laser spectroscopy, and a mechanical compressibility and tension test. Average age from all three tests with all of the, um, you know, possibilities for um, uh, discontinuity um, uh, accounted for was about 90 AD with about a 95% confidence level. But then came this year, 2022, and this uh, fellow, uh, Liberato Di Caro, and uh, you know, this is a whole group of people over at the, uh, the equivalent of Los Alamos, right? The equivalent of the National Laboratories of Italy. This whole group uh, under Liberato Di Caro did a brand new uh, kind of dating, and what's called an X-ray, um, a wide angle X-ray scattering dating. And uh, they peer reviewed, uh, they did a peer reviewed um, a series of tests uh, on this uh, for two and a half years before actually doing the dating on the shroud material. Finally, of course, when that was accepted, they went ahead and did the shroud test. What did they date the shroud to be? Between 55 to 74 AD. Whoa! right at the time of Jesus, commensurate with Giulio Fonti's uh, dating. I'm not kidding you. Uh, this is just really remarkable. And they totally disproved and discredited the 1988 carbon dating because this kind of um, uh, X-ray scattering um, uh, dating test basically allows you to know what the secular temperature uh, of um, a material has been throughout the course of its existence. Well, if you're going to make um, the shroud to be 700 years old, the Secular temperature every day of its existence would have had to have been 134 degrees. Like burning hot every single day, like in an oven. Ridiculous. That carbon dating is wrong. It's very likely that the date of the shroud is between 55 to 74, give or take whatever it is, 50 years. So let's now go to something really interesting as well. And I'm just, in the last few minutes, I just want to tell you about the particle radiation hypothesis. The part, uh, right now, we know for a fact there's only one way of producing that image on the shroud because of its peculiarities. Radiation, it's the only way. 
Now, there's two kinds of radiation that could do it. One has been postulated by John Jackson and um, uh, uh, by um, uh, Paolo Di Lazzaro, and uh, they, their team actually did uh, uh, an, an, um, a test on what was called uh, columnated ultraviolet vacuum uh, radiation. And what it would have taken to produce that image in that way, which you would have gotten very, very precise three-dimensional imaging from it, it would be um, uh, six to eight billion, with a B, billion watts of light energy for one forty billionth of a second. That's the requirement. A half a million searchlights worth of light energy uh, to give rise to that image for one forty billionth of a second. Dead bodies do not normally do this. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, what, was, what is also required is that the body becomes spiritual. The body becomes mechanically transparent so that the tr th shroud can actually penetrate at least three sixteenths of an inch into the body so that you can get uh, the um, layering, the depth layering from an MRA-like approach, right? Uh, the depth layering of the bones inside the hand, the bone in the backbone compared to the skin on the surface, all that depth layering on the inside as well as the outside from the skin to the shroud itself is all recorded perfectly on the shroud. So the body's got to become spiritual. Dead bodies generally don't do that either. Now I'm going to cut to the chase. There's one other radiation hypothesis that explains every single enigma on the shroud, and that's called the particle radiation hypothesis. Uh, I don't have enough time to explain it right now, but particle radiation hypothesis comes from what's called a low temperature nuclear disintegration. So every stable atomic nucleus in that body is going to simultaneously start disintegrating in a low temperature nuclear reaction. And so the body is literally disappearing away. And as the body disappears uh, away, of course, as it's disappearing, it's going to give rise to one major neutron flux, proton alpha particle flux, right? You're going to get all this shower of particles is just blasting out of this body in a big white light. And by the way, a big boom. And of course, when all of this happens, uh, you can actually get not only the image there, but you can explain a bunch of other things on the shroud that are hitherto unexplained. First of all, you don't even have to worry about how the body became spiritually transparent if the body disintegrated, literally in a nuclear uh, reaction. But what's even more important is you can explain how the blood stains have perfect integrity on the shroud. How could the, the, the shroud be lying on that body for a day and a half at least, and then somebody come along after all the blood is coagulated between the body and the shroud and rip that uh, shroud right off? You'd have so so many disfigurements of those blood stains, et cetera, et cetera. Not a one is there on that shroud. That, that, the blood on the shroud is in incredibly good condition. Number two, the actual color of the blood, right? Most blood, as it gets older, becomes brownish, blackish. The, the blood on the shroud is bright red. Uh, all you need is a neutron flux to explain that baby. And of course, the, the same thing, uh, right, if you start going the tremendous longevity of the cloth. I mean, this cloth has lasted, it has, it's like resistant to solids, it's resistant to everything. You know, you look at it and you go, how is this possible? And I'll just come to the chase, you know, right now that uh, uh, you get a neutron flux uh, going, and that, those neutrons are going to break the uh, carbonyl bonds inside uh, the, the cloth, and, and when they break it, they're going to reinforce in much more structured, better uh, carbonyl bonds um, that are in chains uh, that are much stronger, and that's the explanation. I'll just quickly go to the uh, final thought. I mean, when you look at this, we have now a test where we can prove this. All we need to do is get at that shroud uh, the next time the scientific test goes uh, forward. Because if there was a real nuclear reaction, a low temperature nuclear disintegration, by the way, this is a real miracle. Bodies simul do not go through a complete nuclear disintegration simultaneously after death and leave big, huge light and booms. They just don't do this. So of course, the main thing to recognize is we got a test now. And that test is cosmogenic is isotopes. And so if you, we start finding an abundance 
abundance of chlorine 36 and calcium 41 that are only produced in nuclear reactions, and they're there in abundance on this shroud. You had a nuclear reaction there, particle radiation's the explanation, and particle radiation's the, ex the explanation. It's a miracle. If ultraviolet radiation's the explanation, it's a miracle. In other words, we're getting to the point now where we can see not only Jesus Christ and the truth of him in his words and in his spirit and in his church, we can see Jesus Christ now through the lens of science, risen in glory, risen in light, risen, as it were, master of the nuclear power of the universe, risen as God would have us discover it 2,000 years later in a skeptical scientific generation so he could just go, gotcha. Thank you so much, everybody.